Psalm 91 is where I'd like you to turn in your Bibles for the message this afternoon. Psalm 91, we have a real simple message. And uh, I don't know when, but I know that at one time or another, or at least I believe one time or another, I've preached a message to you from Psalm 91, certainly one of my favorite psalms. Uh, but the Lord laid it on my heart as I was praying this week about what to share with you and, and uh, where to be in the preaching of God's Word. The Lord really laid this psalm on my heart and encouraged me with it. So I thought I would share that with you. And again, it does go along with that song that where, especially at the end of the chorus, where it says, Oh, for grace to trust him more. And boy, how we need to trust the Lord Jesus. We need to trust him in all the areas of life. Our Sunday school lesson was about that today. The children of Israel uh, being there at the edge of the promised land, having the opportunity to enter the promised land and take over and uh, destroy the giants. And yet, because of their unbelief, they were not allowed to enter into God's rest, all because they would not trust him. And uh, then today, now, this afternoon, we're going to look at Psalm 91. I don't know for sure, but I believe that Psalm 91 is a psalm written by Moses. Psalm 90 is, and I believe 91 is also. That's my opinion. And uh, it seems to be uh, one that uh, it fits right along with when you know Moses and the story of Moses, that it makes sense that he would be the one that God would use to pen this. But we'll start with verse number one, where we're given an introduction, and then we'll pray, and then we'll continue on with the psalm. And what I've done is I've just broken the psalm down into, uh, let's see here, about six different sections uh, that uh, I believe the psalm divides into. And it will encourage us, I believe, in this area of we can trust the Lord. And we have been given a great refuge in him, which means that you and I should not fear in the days that we are living in, because God is our refuge and strength. Let's look at verse 1, and then we'll pray. Psalm 91, verse 1, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for that truth that we just read. Thank you that we have the opportunity to abide under your shadow Lord, this, this afternoon, as best we know how, we submit ourselves to you. And Lord, we ask for that grace that we would be able to be found under your shadow. Lord, that we would be under your protection. Lord, we want to dwell in your secret place. Teach us what that means. Teach us to seek that. Lord, start with me and work through every member of our church that we would seek that. We thank you, Lord, that you will. In Jesus' name, amen. As we look at the psalm here and we see that first verse, I believe that that first verse is an introduction to the psalm. It tells us really what this psalm is all about, that in the end, if you are one of those who uh, is dwelling in the secret place of the Most High, you'll be able to abide under His shadow. Now, that, that's certainly a wonderful thing when we think about the shadow of the Almighty. It's obvious there that it's speaking about a place of protection, that you are under his care and protection. When you think about, again, if this was Moses, or even if it wasn't, that wrote this psalm, they lived in an arid climate with a hot sun. And one of the things that was so important to them was a place of shade. And it would provide comfort, and it would also provide protection. That's the idea given there that there are some who are allowed to abide under his shadow, to trust in him. Well, who are those people? Those are the people that dwell in his secret place. And I would point out to you those two words, number one, dwell, and then number two, abide. Meditate on those in your own time and think about what they mean. It basically means to not just be somewhere for a short amount of time, but to literally have in your mind this idea that I am going to stay here. This is my permanent dwelling place. He that dwelleth in the secret place the one that goes to the secret place of the Lord, and they make that their home, that their refuge. That's the place where they hang out. When they have, when they have uh, all of their work for the day done, when they don't have to be gone anymore, where do they go back to? They go back to the secret place of the Most High. That is the idea of this person. And then the word abide is the same idea. It's they are going to remain there, and they are going to stay there. As I share kind of uh, my heart with you as I preach God's word to you, you get to hopefully kind of see who I am, and uh, you probably learn more about me than you want to learn. 
But one of the things to me that is most special about marriage is the idea that there is an individual, there is a person who has decided that all of their life they're going to share everything with you. That's a wonderful truth. That's a wonderful, again, that's to me one of the most spectacular things about marriage is that there's somebody who wants to share life with you. Every little thing, not just the big things of life. All family will do that. I have brothers and sisters, and they share life with me in general. We share with one another what's going on in our lives. We spend time together. But with, for instance, my brothers, whom I'm very close to and love and appreciate them, and I, I just can't wait to spend more time with them. Every time I get an opportunity to spend time with them, it's, a, it's just a joy to my heart, and I enjoy being with them. But there always comes a time when we say goodbye. And they're probably glad to say goodbye to little Mikey and leave him alone. And there are probably times when I'm glad to go my separate way. I want to be with my family. But again, in marriage, one of the things that has been a blessing to me is this idea that there's somebody who, when they go home, they go home to you. Now, wait a minute. Let's apply that same idea to our relationship with the Heavenly Father. I'm glad that he never wants to say goodbye. Isn't that an amazing thing? He loves you so much, he never wants to say goodbye. And of course, he doesn't, does he? He said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. But now he calls on you and me to abide in him, to dwell with him. And when we dwell with him, we are able to abide under his shadow. It is the place God wants us to be. My Sunday school class this morning, I touched on the fact that God wants us to spend time with him in such a way that when the trials of life come and the testings of faith come, like when the children of Israel were on the edge of the promised land and the ten spies came back with an evil report of the land and said, there are giants in the land, that if the people of God had been walking closely with God, they would have been like Caleb and Joshua, their hearts full of faith, and they would have said with Caleb and Joshua, we be well able to overcome those giants. We be well able to take over the land. But they didn't walk with God. I encourage my Sunday school class, that's why we need to walk with God daily. That's why, listen, we need to set aside the things of the world. Set aside the music of the world, the movies and the television of the world, the social media, the news, and all those things. Not that they can't have a place in our lives and in moderation to enjoy those things and see those things. But listen, be careful. Be careful. They are like a wet blanket on your relationship with God. Use them sparingly and prayerfully in all things, guarding your relationship with God. Why? Because you're going to enter into trials. That's the idea of verse number one, that we dwell in the secret place of the Most High. Which brings me now to verse two, which verse one was the introduction I call verse two, the statement of faith. Notice the determination in verse two. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in Him will I trust. That is a statement of faith, and I love the determination in that verse. That the psalmist here is saying, listen, this is something I'm determined, I'm going to say this of the Lord. That He is my refuge and my fortress, my God. And I'm going to say this, that I will trust in Him. There's no hedging on it, there's no maybe, it's not if, there's no mealy mouth statement about it, but rather, this is what I have determined. I love that about this psalm and his statement of faith there. And friends, let me encourage you to have that statement of faith. Verses 3 and 4, then, I would title, Your Deliverance. Now, what I want to point out to you is when we get to verse 3, notice the change in the audience. Verses 1 and 2 are more just kind of open statements. Now, verse 3 begins a whole section where he is talking to or writing to somebody else. Okay? Look at that in verse 3. Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Now he goes from an introduction and a statement of faith to talking about your deliverance. And who is the audience of the psalmist? All of us are. 
And I would have you notice that he uses the word the, which means it's singular. He's talking to you as an individual that God has written this psalm for you. Not for the church as a whole, but for all of us as individuals, he's written this psalm. That we have deliverance. Verse 3 talks about the dangers that are there. Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. I love that in verse 3 where it talks about the snare of the fowler. Uh, That's not something that we often talk about today. It's not something that we often use as an analogy uh, these days. But in the days in which this psalm was written, one of the ways that they would catch birds or food, or for whatever reason, is they would lay some kind of a snare for them. And I don't know what that would look like exactly. I can imagine different things, maybe a net laid out on the ground that's covered, and then when uh, you know they'd lay some food in the middle of that net or something like that, and have some kind of a way where when the bird gets in the middle of it, they can lift that net up, or maybe it was a way to just catch the bird by its foot. I'm not sure what, but they would somehow entrap the bird with a net or a noose or something like that in a snare. Have you ever felt like Satan had it out for you? You should, because he does. Have you ever felt like in life maybe there are people who, for some reason or another, they are your enemies, and they're trying to entrap you in different things? The day and age in which we live, as you read the news, you'll notice that there are wicked and evil people in this world who would love to ensnare us. But friends, we shouldn't fear. There are dangers out there, but what does the Word of God say? Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler. Listen, I love the verse in another psalm where the psalmist says, He made my feet like hinds' feet. The idea of that being almost like a mountain goat or a a type of deer that lives in the mountains and they are able to climb on the edge of the rocks and they get their feet into just the exact perfect place on the rock and it looks as if they're miraculously, you know, maybe they have suction cups on their feet or something that keep them to the rock, but they don't. God has just given them sure feet. And the psalmist in another place says, "He he made my feet like hind's feet. In other words, God is able to help you to be able to miraculously walk through the minefields of this life so that you can make it to the other side without being entrapped. And then it talks about at the end of verse 3, a noisome pestilence. That would be a disease that is coming through that God will deliver us from those things. That's our deliverance. Verse 4 doesn't mention the dangers. It mentions the source of his salvation. He shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. So what is the provision that God has made for our deliverance? How is God going to provide deliverance for us? This is how he's going to do it. His presence. His presence. He shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shalt thou trust. How does God protect me in the situation where there's someone trying to ensnare me? How does God protect me when the noisome pestilence is coming through? He draws me close to himself. And he holds me tightly to himself. His presence is my salvation. Do you sense a theme there? You sense in the early verses of this psalm that God wants you to draw close to him? That when you get far from the Lord, you're foolish? Because the salvation is in his presence. So shouldn't we draw close to him? Shouldn't we seek to be with him in all things? I think we should. In fact, I know we should. Look at verses 5 through 8 of Psalm 91. Look at these verses. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Only with thine eyes thou shalt behold, and see the reward of the wicked. We saw in verse 1 the introduction. Verse 2 was the statement of faith. Verses 3 and 4 are your deliverance. Verses 5 through 8 are your confidence. He starts out in verse 5 and maybe even into verse 6. He gives four different sources of danger. He talks about a terror by night. There's an arrow by day. There's pestilence that walks in darkness. There's destruction that wastes at noonday. 
There's four different types of danger there, and we are not to fear any of them. Rather, we are to have confidence. Are there dangers in this world? Yes. We do live in a dangerous world, but we are not to fear. And the reason is, is because, look at what it says in verse 7, a thousand shall fall at thy side and 10,000 at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. You see, God will and has provided a miraculous salvation for us. That Yes, others may be falling at my right hand and at my left. They may be falling all around me. Thousands of them are falling at, at the snare of the fowler, at this noisome pestilence, at this arrow that flies by day. All of these different things. People are falling all around me. Shouldn't I fear? And the answer is no. God will miraculously enable you to stand in the midst of people falling all around you. And then I love verse 8. I, I think personally that verse number 8 is a glimpse into the judgment day and the millennium. When it says, only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. And that is in the, that is in the context of seeing the thousands fall all around us. That as we watch that, you know what we'll be able to say? God is protecting me. God is keeping me through all of this. That I don't have to fear a thing. And listen, this is so important for us to, to recognize. Is the world falling apart? Yes. Is our nation falling apart? Yes. Our nation is definitely falling apart. But that should not concern you. And I, I, that's a little bit of an overstatement, but I th hope you understand what I mean. I, I don't mean that we shouldn't lament over that or cry over that or worry about it. Obviously, we, we want to. But please understand that that should not be something where we just collapse in fear over those things. Why? Because, listen, God is controlling all things. And for you and me, he will protect us and he will work on our behalf. And that, listen, those things are happening to this world because this world is wicked. Why is America falling apart? Because she's wicked. She's ungodly. She's turned from God a long time ago. And I love this nation greatly, but she has turned to sin. And guess what happens every time a nation turns to sin? Judgment comes. And America will be no different. And so as we see that, you know what we're going to see? Number one, God preserving us. Number two, we'll see the reward of the wicked. Sometimes we can get discouraged as if it were happening to us. No, no, listen. It's not happening to us. We're not citizens of this country. We're citizens in one way, but in a spiritual way, the right way, we're citizens of heaven. We're in this world and we see all this going around here, but listen, <laughs> That's not me, that's them. God still has called me to be a witness and a testimony, to be a separate people, peculiar unto himself. So I'll see people fall around me, but God's provision is going to keep me. And friends, I want to encourage you that if everything falls apart tomorrow, I say this to you often, but I want to remind you, if everything falls apart tomorrow, here's what you know. God will provide for you. The psalmist, I believe it's Psalm 37, says, I have been young and now am old, yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. God will provide for you. And that's not to say it won't be difficult, that there won't be tears and sorrow and difficulties. But listen, people all over the world today are going through difficulties. All over the world. Sri Lanka right now is going through major upheaval. In the Netherlands, they're going through it too. I just think of Sri Lanka because it's a little bit more of a poorer country and they're facing a little bit more difficulty. But listen, it, suddenly we think when it happens to us, it's, it's some tragedy that nobody else has ever seen before. Actually, throughout human history, this has been the case more often than not. And God has always provided for his people. Have you read the Old Testament? Have you seen how God provided for his people? Do you think he's changed since then? Or maybe here in America, this is the one place where it won't work? No, listen, God will provide. He will care for you and me. 
and we will have a job to do. By the way, I heard one of our missionaries, Brother Mark Preem, I heard from Brother Wagenschutz this week. Brother Wagenschutz was up at camp. He's Mark Preem's pastor. Mark Preem is our missionary in Ukraine. Brother Wagenschutz mentioned that through this whole war that's going on in Ukraine, by the way, what a tragedy. What a horrible thing. Nobody likes war. And I wish it would never have happened. But you know, God always turns difficult things into a blessing. Always. And here's the blessing. The blessing is that since the war started, however many months ago, Brother Preem, this week, is set to hand out, by the way, print, and then hand out his one millionth piece of literature. Since the war started. Brother Wagon Schutz was telling us that when the war started, Brother Wag- or, I'm sorry, Brother Preem used his church van to help the military haul sandbags wherever they needed to take them. And so while he's doing that, he gets done with one day and he says to this um, doctor, I think, that he saw there, and he said, if I can ever do anything for you, you let me know. And the doctor said, well, we could really use such and such a medicines for our clinic or hospital, whatever it is, because there you don't, the government doesn't provide it, you, you gotta go get it yourself. So Brother Preem had some money, he went and bought the medicines, brought it to the doctor, and the doctor said, hey, could I give your number to somebody else? And Brother Preem said, yeah, thinking it was maybe some other doctor who might need some help with medicines or whatever. It ends up that the person called Brother Preem, and this person was worked for the military and fed all of the soldiers and probably other people as well, and they had all of this food that's left over that they have to give away. And this person said to Brother Preem, can I give this food to you so that you can distribute it? The only thing is you have to come every day. And Brother Preem said, we'll get it done. And so he has been taking that food and feeding people in Odessa. And basically everybody who gets fed gets the gospel before they get fed. Do you understand that when hard times come, And I'm not hoping that something like that happens here. But when hard times come, God always provides a way for us to see good come out of what seems to be evil. That's just God's nature. And why do we think that with us it's going to be something different as if tomorrow when it all collapses, oh, woe is us, it'll just never be the same. No, actually, it will. In fact, if anything, we will have more to do than we ever had before. And shame on us if everything falls apart and we sit in a corner and cry a pity party as God's people when we would be in a situation where the world around us would need us to show them that our God is real. That would be the time when maybe for once people in Madison would actually believe that our God is real. But it all depends on how we respond, doesn't it? Let's continue reading on. We saw the confidence, that's verses 5 through 8. We're going to look at our protection in verses 9 through 13. Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the most high thy habitation, there shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against the stone. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and adder, the young lion and the dragon shalt thou trample under feet. I find it interesting, by the way, that he mentions that there is a dragon that we will trample under our feet. Seems to me in the Bible there's a certain dragon talked about in Revelation that happens to be the wicked one. And didn't, isn't it Paul who wrote to, in one of his letters to a church, he said, Satan, I'm sorry, God will bruise Satan under your feet shortly. Maybe that's a reference to that. I don't know, just a thought. But here's what I know. In those verses 9 through 13, we are given a reminder of the protection that we have. First of all, let me point out to you that our protection is angelic. That God will give his angels charge over us. to Keep us in all our ways. Boy, there's a great promise. That where we go, he sends his angels, his army, his soldiers with us protecting us. I want to remind you that in these scriptures here, this is the promise that Satan tried to use to get Jesus to tempt the Father. 
But of course, Jesus responded to him, it is written, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. But at the same time, did Jesus have the protection that's promised here? And the answer is yes. Now, did Jesus die? Yes. But he did not die a moment before it was the Father's will. Though the Jews wanted to get him, though the Romans would have loved to have had him out of the way, though you know Satan himself was set against Jesus, he could not be touched until the moment it was the Father's perfect will for him to die and shed his blood for you and for me. He had the protection that God was promising here. Now, wait a minute. You have that same protection. Not to say that you won't someday die at the hands of persecutors. You might. Christians have for centuries. Nothing new there. But I do know this. If you're living for God, Satan will not be able to touch you before, not even a moment before, it is the Father's will. If you're serving him faithfully, then he will watch over you. Your protection is angelic. I think not only about Jesus who had that protection, but Peter had the same protection. You remember as Peter was in the prison and the church made prayer unto God night and day for Peter, and God sent an angel into the prison. Do you remember that in the book of Acts? I love it because the angel comes up to Peter and doesn't just you know, gently nudge him awake kicks him in the side. Hey, Peter, what are you doing sleeping? Get up. I've got a job for you. Get out there. And as Peter walks up to the gate or the door, it opens before him. And then he knew that God had sent his angel. God had provided for Peter. Now, did there come a day where Peter died? Yeah, tradition tells us that Peter died crucified upside down at his own request because he didn't feel worthy to suffer the same death as his Savior, the Lord Jesus. That's what tradition tells us. But listen, we know that Peter died eventually, but not a moment before it was the Father's will. I think about the Apostle Paul who had the same protection. You remember in the book of Acts, late in the book of the Acts, as he's going toward Rome to appeal to Caesar that they end up shipwrecked on an island and he's helping carry wood for the fire and he reaches in and what happens? A viper comes out of the fire and latches on to Paul who shakes it off into the fire and he felt no harm and they thought he was a god. No, but he had God's protection. Listen, God will do the same for you. Now again, did Paul lose his life? Yeah. As far as we know, Nero took his life with the swing of a sword and cut his head off. Best we know. But not a moment before it was the Father's will. Your protection is promised by the Father. Let's look at verses 14 through 16. We'll close this message and this Study of Psalm 91 out, verses 14 through 16. Because he hath let, set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high, because he hath known my name. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. Now, can I point out to you something interesting about verses 14 through 16? The interesting thing about those verses is the speaker has changed. The first couple of verses were the psalmist writing about himself. The first one was an introduction. The second one was a statement of faith. Then from verses 3 to verse 13, the psalmist there is making statements about how you and I can trust in the Lord, that we can have confidence, that if we're dwelling in a secret place, that we'll abide under a shadow and all of that is good. Now in verse 14, it shifts and God tells, if it's Moses, I can imagine God saying, okay, Moses, you're done now, shh. Now let me talk to them. And here's what God says. Because he hath set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high because he hath known my name. It tells us, by the way, the key to dwelling in a secret place. It's setting our love upon him. It's talking about you and me. That, listen, God values it when we set our love upon him. And do you understand that that's really what God wants from you? God's not looking for money from you. God's not looking for a certain number of tracts to be distributed from you every week. God's not looking for this thing or that thing or, you know, whatever, to serve in this ministry or that ministry necessarily. What God is looking for from you and from me is that we would set our love upon him. 
Because the truth of the matter is, if we'll set our love upon him, we'll freely open up our wallet and give. If we'll set our love upon him, we will freely hand out tracts to everybody that we can to tell them about the love of God. If we've set our love upon him, we will freely serve in ministries because we love him. He wants us to set our love upon him. And by the way, when you love him, you'll do it with joy. It won't be a, a bummer or a drag to do those things when you love the Lord. There are promises there. I counted seven of them. Somebody else might have a different number. But seven promises from God because we set our love upon him that we would be delivered, that we would be set on high, that our prayers would be answered, that we would find deliverance in his presence, that he would honor us, that he would give us long life, and that he would give us salvation. All because we set our love upon him. Let me encourage you this afternoon, set your love upon the Father. Let me encourage you as well to read through this psalm, meditate on it, and enjoy serving the Lord and loving him. Let's pray.